And on this one, I really want to emphasize uh, the art and the science of horticulture. And so uh, that's the art is the practice of it. And if there's any time that the farmer to farmer type of uh, technology transfer can really help, this is one of them. Because one tool can make a huge difference when it comes to weeds. And so we'll, let's take a look at them, see, get a few ideas here. So uh, again, just to emphasize what is not allowed in organic, obviously synthetic herbicides are not allowed. So your, your pre-emerge herbicides like um, Surflan, Prancep, uh, Curb, so, so forth, those are not allowed. Your post-emerge, your contact and systemics like Roundup, Paraquat, they're not allowed. And, and by the way, Roundup is, is, has been banned in many countries already. It may end up, we may end up losing that in this country. It's got some real serious issues. Uh, for a long time, it seemed like a miracle, and it really was when it first came out, uh, tied into um, seed technology for, for, genetic, for genetically engineered. It's now sprayed on hundreds of millions of acres. It's used in hundreds of millions of pounds at a time. So now it's really in the environment, and it binds um, micronutrients very strongly. It chelates them, and that's how it works in plants. So it chelates manganese. That's part of an enzymatic reaction, and the plant becomes sick, and it is infested by fusarium. That's what actually kills the plant. It's, it's not a chemical uh, directly. It's indirectly. So turns out that that, that same function happens in, to microbes and your gut has 10 times more microbes and cells in the gut from the microbial population than you have in your body. Uh-oh. So that's the, one of the unknown, unintended con consequences of, of some of the, some of the uh, chemical uh, technology we have. So anyways, that's sort of an FYI on that. Uh, I just want to kind of talk about some concepts. Uh, one, Bermuda grass and Johnson grass. Uh, if you are transitioning to going into production and you've got them and, and et cetera, I mean, it is totally crazy to go into a field of Bermuda grass. Uh, I have had growers do that. I've, said, I've told them not on the front end, and they did it anyway, so it took a lot of time to, to work through that. So, uh, but uh, here's an instance that if you were going, if you're, you, know, you had an option and you were going to go into a three-year transition, knock it all out first with Roundup, basically. Uh, and or you can do a strategy of cover cropping. And uh, there is a way to cover crop and get rid of both of these. John, you can actually, you can get rid of Johnson grass. I have done this with growers. It's through cover cropping, but it's like a whole series of two years worth of cover cropping and tillage and cover cropping and tillage. And it's shading it out, smothering it out, that sort of thing. So anyways, do not let weeds go to seed, okay? Because when, when one pigweed plant produces a, a seed head, it, it's like hundreds of millions of seed. It's adding into the seed bank. They're just going to become a problem next year. Pretty much common sense. Bare soil is, equals weeds. And we're going to look at that in just a second. So keep the soil covered. Keep it covered with cover crops, living mulches, grass alleyways, organic mulches. And here's one. I call it a farmer's axiom. Okay. And that is that the better the weed control, the better the crop. The point is, is that you'll spend less time on overgrown weeds and more time on crop TLC and pest control. It's just kind of a natural consequence of this. If you're out there dealing with overgrown patch, you're spending too much energy, too much time and labor. It's costing money. But the main thing, it's your attention, is focused on this overgrown crop and you now have less time to take care of the plant, pay attention to the little small details like the pest control. And so that's, that's another little concept. Uh, next, I want to talk about why do weeds even grow and the concept uh, and the actual the ecological principle of ecological succession. So I want to do this because it's really important when you're farming, it, when you're preparing a field to plant, you have to work the soil. The soil is exposed. It's bare. Mm -hmm. When you're doing crops, you do the same thing. Even, even the classic blueberry berm, where you have the raised bed and you have a wood chip mulch or some kind of sawdust mulch or even a hay mulch there, even that has an edge, okay? There's the grass and then there's the berm. 
that's an edge. So there's ecological succession that can happen there too. So ecological succession is the progressive change in species over time on a piece of land. And here's the classic image of an exposed site over here on the left, rocks. And then over time, it's populated by pioneering species. And then uh, those are usually known as weeds and uh, you know, primitive plants. And then that uh, goes and evolves into grasses and then uh, herbaceous perennials, shrubs and trees, and then all the way to the climax forest. So this is high school biology. It's just kind of a reminder. Um, and this is, uh, this is kind of what we have here in Metcalf County. Everywhere you look, there's, a, there's a, some kind of succession. Every field border, every road ditch, every, every edge of the forest, it's all happening. And, if, and, and so if you, if you have a pasture here and you abandon that pasture, what happens after 15 years? After five years, boom, trees coming back on you, right? That's why you have a brush hog and you keep after it. So that's succession. That's just natural. And so um, the other thing is that now here's uh, something that um, this whole new kind of thinking about soil biology is that what is also at play is that the above ground plant succession is mirrored by a below ground soil food web succession. Now this is very interesting. It really plays into into your concept and how you can use it as a, in part of your toolbox because if you understand that, weeds are heavily uh, bacterial dominated. These kinds of soils are where weeds thrive in. And as, as that succession increases to more perennial woody nature for shrubs and trees, it becomes more fungal dominated. So understanding that is good because in reverse you can kind of help control some of these things. Um, so here's, here's an example of disturbance. And so um, what happens, you have a succession, it's moving along, and disturbance happens. A glacier is disturbance, a hurricane is disturbance, but you know, and, and fire is in a, in a forest, but you know what else is? Tillage. So every time you're, you till a field, you are disturbing the succession, and whoosh, you're throwing it right back to the beginning. What happens at the beginning of succession? There's a universal law of nature does not like the soil to be bare, uh, it, it, it abhors a vacuum, and so therefore it sends in its troops, these pioneer species or weeds, to occupy that space, heal the land, and start back over. So that's why weeds are growing. They're, they're really awesome plants, really. You just got to admire them. And it's kind of this interesting thing to observe them and watch the species of weeds change and what you do as a, as a farm manager to kind of keep on top of them. And so um, that, it's helpful to kind of just put all that in perspective. And the bottom line is that if, when you have this bare soil and you have moisture and sunlight, because of this seed bank, in, in a couple of weeks, boom, you'll have a flush of weeds. That's just how things work. So you have to understand that to be on top of weeds. Uh, and then in, in classic organic farming, we call it uh, mini little hammers. You need all these little types of strategies to work for you. This, this one's on vegetable production. I'm going to give you some tips on, on blueberries. 